who I am and my background. Um, UAF alumni graduated in 1993, my background geological engineering, uh, and then I received uh, or obtained my professional engineering and civil engineering uh, in 1999. Worked on TAPS for my entire professional career. My first seven years out of college, I was an environmental consultant in environmental remediation, restoration up and down the line. Uh, in 2002, I got into oil spill response, and since 2002, I've been the emergency preparedness manager for TAPS. So that's that's me. So what what the way I wanted to focus this conversation today? Um, you know, my primary accountabilities are on the oil spill contingency plan, our preparedness, and our response activities. But I always like to start with the prevention. Uh, because that is the number one thing. That is our the most important thing. First and foremost, we have to be um, preventing any kind of spills. Uh, that is our most significant task. With that, obviously, from a, a response standpoint, we have to be ready to respond on a daily basis uh, up and down the line. And to achieve that, um, that's how we get there through our preparedness program. So moving on. Safe operations. Um, First thing, you know, our, our pipeline controller. So it's controlled by our operations control center. There's a very rigorous program about becoming a, a controller. As recently, there have been a lot of uh, updated uh, regulations from the USDOT, um, which is the, try not to use so many acronyms. I mean, we use them, holy cows, all the time at Alaska, but it's the FIMSA, which is the Pipeline Hazardous Material Safety Administration, which is the primary driver on OCC. Uh, our pipeline control system, um, that's how we talk to all the valves and all of the equipment up and down the line. So we have three redundant systems that oversee the control systems. Um, primary is the fiber optic system. Uh, it's relatively newer, I guess early 2000s, late 90s is when that was installed. Um, next is the microwave repeaters that we have. AT&T um, maintains those in partnership with Alyeska for mountaintop repeaters. And then we have the VHF radio system. Uh, when I first started with Alyeska, it was probably routine to lose uh, um, contact with the valve on occasion. And we either had to shut down or you had to man it. So those were kind of the requirements. But with our much more robust system and the three parallels, I'm not aware of uh, a manning situation in a number of years, so um, really definitely have improved there. Okay, let's see. Pipeline control system, we also have uh, um, our leak detection system. That's one of the, the primary drivers of OCC and OM t uh, oil movements for existing. Um, we have three systems on the pipeline. We have our transient volume balance system, our line volume balance system, and our pressure deviation alarm. Each three of them, they're, they're Unfortunately, there's no one perfect answer for leak detection. Each each one of those components does a little bit different. The um, trying to remember if I, TVB is probably the most robust. So what what that is is it's a computer model, hydraulic model again, that is taking in real data from the system and it's going through its its parallel system and it can detect if there's any type of imbalance. When I say it's the most precise, that's the alarm, if we get it, that actually can really pinpoint a location. The LVB system, line volume balance, is a, a mass balance. So every 24 hours, it's doing an accounting, and it's adjusting for pressures and temperatures. LVB is looking for the small leaks, the really, really small ones, which unfortunately you know, do take time to, for us to detect. Um, and it's less precise. It would give you a geographical area of, of where a leak indication is. Pressure deviation alarm is the fastest, but it's, it's for a large spill, you know, uh, a significant release. Um, we call it in the industry, it's a terrible term, but it's a guillotine failure is what, what they use. Um, but because the pressure would so quickly reduce um, such a radical drop, we see that detection, you know, quite, quite rapidly. Right now, the regulatory requirement is 1% of daily throughput. So we're in the 500,000 barrel range. So that's our, our leak detection um, threshold that TVB is measuring. Um, we have to, we test it, you know, one, we do an annual review of that system. So what that does, we have a, a operating agreement with our agencies with BLM and ADC. Um, 
So what they actually do is they take a whole year's worth of actual data and they put it in their model and then they feed um, you know, fake spills on top of that data and see if the system detects it. That's one avenue of the report, uh, how we prove that we are meeting that 1%. The other um, um, test that we do, we do an annual commodity release test where we actually, um, I guess it used to be years ago, we would actually hook up trucks to a known point and actually de-inventory some oil from the system and measure how fast our system responded. Now what we do, similar concept, where we divert a small amount into a tank and again, um, those are witnessed by the agencies. They're in the room with us while we do that to see if the system actually performs as, as possible. Um, but to get a, a better direct answer to your question, um, the lower we go, um, it, one, it might take longer to detect than that 24 hours for, for a low volume. And then um, our sensitivity or our errors become increased. So. Right now, at that 1%, we feel we're in the 95% confidence level. Um, as you get, say, a half a percent, we're probably only 90% of the time able to, to detect at that, that lower level. And, and again, it just keeps going on. The other things that we have on top of that, you know, again, for these, these small releases that could be a concern, um, you know, we have weekly aerial surveillances that are ongoing. We have rover rounds at all the facilities. They're done twice per shift. We have uh, security that's doing roving rounds up and down the pipeline. Um, we're flying security. They don't quite cover the entire line on a daily basis, but significant portions of the line on a daily basis, assuming the weather is appropriate, they are over flying it. Um, to date, we've had, to my knowledge, all, all of the releases that, that we have had on the line from the main line, uh, even if they were detected by OCC, they were, they were also detected either simultaneously or just prior by, by human rounds. You know, the third thing that we do, because it's 800 miles, it's remote area, we have a lot of signage, a lot of posting. Um, we try to go out to the public and the community and have those conversations, hear are the numbers to call. Um, in a lot of ways, uh, community members who have the pipeline in their backyard are some of our best eyes and ears out there. I guess the one other one is remote monitoring that security does. Um, we do have a lot of infrastructure out there where we, we have a security operations center that's in Anchorage. So they have cameras, all the facilities, tankage have cameras on them, as well as you know critical infrastructure, uh, pipeline crossings are, are one of the primary ones where we actually have cameras on at this, you know, again, to help detect or help make sure nobody is out there who's not supposed to be out there doing any activity. Um, and so uh, I'll try to keep the, um, the prevention to a high level. That's not my, my primary function. So um, it's probably a two hour presentation just going through all that. So I'm gonna try to keep it at a, a real high level. But next, uh, integrity management. Um, this, is, this is really important, internal corrosion. You just asked about that. Um, a number of the things we're doing, um, you know, first, it kind of starts with our inline inspection pegging program. So we do that every two to three years, depending on what we saw the last time. Um, we just ran one uh, this spring um, through the line. Uh, it was the most sophisticated pig yet that we've run through the, the line. It had many different, uh, I mean, I think it was about 10,000 pounds. It looked like a freight train, you know, size-wise coming down. Um, a lot of coordination had to be done to run that successfully. One of the challenges we have is from pump station four all the way to Valdez. That's a very significant run. You want to make sure you don't have data loss. You want to make sure um, you're getting it. What you're seeing here on this picture are actually um, areas where we, we put in small imperfections in the pipeline. That's one of the ways we measure the pigging data. So the vendor doesn't know where those locations are, but we do. Um, and we can actually do a test when we have that data and review it and say yes, you know, this, this see if it picked it up. Um, you know, other annual programs we have, we have anytime we expose buried pipe, regardless of what the incident or reason for it is, um, we will sandblast it, remove the coating, remove the tape, do a full inspection. 
um, which includes UT inspection, and then if a repair w was necessary, then we can sleeve it. Uh, if it's not necessary, it still has you know the the appropriate amount of wall thickness. Um, then we retape it, recoat it, repaint it, um, and bury it again. We have uh, cathodic protection, um, so we have both impressed um, currents where we have rectifiers going up and down the line in some locations. Some locations we have sacrificial zinc anodes. Um, doing the same thing. We also do this at the facility piping. So obviously the the main line is is probably most people's focus because you know that's consequence wise that's the largest volume. But piping wise, we have a lot of piping at the facilities. We had the incident in 2011 up at uh, Pump Station One, which has driven us to um, do a number of things. Uh, one, we we basically removed all the below ground piping at some of our legacy facilities, Pump Station Two, Pump Station Eleven. Yukon Response Base, Pump Station 10, Pump Station 3 is next year, as well as um, Integrity Digs, uh, Pump Station 7, again, they went into all the below ground piping, we're still using that piping, but they did a full um, inspection of the, all of that below ground piping this year, um, and that's, that's a significant piece of work in, in our prevention side, I think. Um, also, I mean, all this, this corrosion um, pertains to our tanks as well. Um, we have impressed CP. Um, we're, we're putting in a new system at pump station one at tank 111 this year. Um, so it's going to get a new floor, a new cathodic protection system. This is, I'm a lo lot more familiar with this. Uh, my department reports into the right-of-way director and I'm a step up for, for a right-of-way director. And these are programs that that team manages. Um, the river and floodplain monitoring, so this is up on the Sag River there. You can see the washouts, um, you know, 800 miles. We seem to have a 100-year flood at least a year, once a year on somewhere on the line. Um, so we're consistently spending, you know, significant dollars going in to, to rebuild training structures, uh, dikes, uh, berms. Um, you know, it's interesting some of the comments, if, if folks look at that question, you know, <coughs> these, these arms to the right have, you know, done their job from the standpoint that, um, you know, we don't have exposed pipe. Yes, we lost right away access and we have to go in and repair that. But again, what they're designed for is not to dam it up, so to speak, and not have any flooding. It's to protect the integrity of the pipe. Um, significant work every year on, on our, our uh, dikes uh, up and down. Pipeline bridges, obviously an area of concern. There's an annual surveillance, and then once every five years we bring in, I forgot, our, our above ground engineer has a technical term for these guys, but they're actually trained, come out of the lower 48. Uh, yeah, so yes, it is, it's amazing. Um, I don't think, yeah, it looks like a great job. So uh, that's, that's the, they're on the pipeline itself. This, yeah, there's, it comes down and it's doing a left turn. So they're on, on one of our suspended suspension. It is. Um, that is Tanana River. So um, anyways, every five years they come in and do their inspections. Next, uh, mainline valves. Um, so our primary way of limiting spill from a, a pipeline release, um, there's 177 valves on the pipeline. Uh, 71 gate valves, not all of them are automated, uh, I think it's 62, 63 are automa automated, OCC has remote control of those, or, or you can go into the enclosure and, and actually hit a button for it to be actuated. The remaining, um, what, that'd be about nine, are, are manual gate valves. So a lot of times when we have manual gate valves, they're small um, runs next to either a check valve or a block valve and it allows for bypassing flow and do maintenance of different valves. The um, kind of the background, how the pipeline was originally designed, um, the, the valves were spaced originally for no greater than a 50,000 barrel static spill potential. Um, so static is just after you shut down what's available to drain out. It doesn't include the dynamic portion, which would potentially could come out uh, until the valves were shut. Um, additional valves were added, mostly check valves um, on 
the best example are most of our river crossings. And most of our river crossings, yeah, and, and you know, and, and that is one misleading thing, and, and I don't know, and maybe it's something we'll, we'll do a better job in, in uh, a future version of the C plan. Uh, the way we give the max volume in the C plan is for that area, and it may be a seven or eight mile stretch, but it could lead people to believe that you know, the spilled potential on the Gulf Canna River is, is 30,000 barrels. Well, actually, no, right, right between those two valves, it's only, it's 18,000 barrels, still significantly less. Um, our valve maintenance program, um, there's a lot of annual work that's done every year. We have uh, an entire um, preventative maintenance team that does, focuses only on valves. They get an annual um, stroke test, so that's where they partially close and make sure everything's functioning uh, on every valve, um, except the check valves. The check valves, because they don't have an actuator, um, but every, every valve's winterized um, again. Uh, and if we stroke something, let's say we had a shutdown tomorrow, the, the winterization crew has just finished up. If we had a shutdown tomorrow, we close valves, they got to go back out there and again um, do that. So nothing freezes and the valve will function in the middle of the winter. Um, additionally, and I think we're really unique, Alieska is, um, the DOT standard is, it's, it's really high level. It says, you know, basically you will, as an operator, have valves in good working order. That's pretty loose, yeah. defined. It doesn't actually require a valve to seal. Nope. It doesn't. So what we have done is we have our internal valve program, which requires valves to seal. There is some tolerances allowed. Um, each valve has its own tolerances that have been calculated. Uh, we have a, get a memorandum of uh, agreement with the agencies, BLM, JPO, and, and USDOT. Uh, and typically we're out there testing valves. 2000 was, was the last w previous big push where we tested all these valves. Last year and this year, um, we just started again testing valves, and we have another, I think, year and a half of valve testing uh, moving forward. And again, um, so far, you know, we've, we haven't found a valve that appears that we need to uh, replace it, um, but that was the result of the work in 2000. I'm um, thinking there were four or five valves that were not fully sealing. 109 is one of them, correct? Um, yeah. Big one for here, obviously, yeah. I mean, the first one that I worked on was uh, 65, which is just north of the Yukon River. So that was the very first valve. And, and that was an interesting thing. It actually met our, our criteria. Um, per our criteria, it didn't need to be replaced. But because, again, of where it was on the banks of the Yukon River, the company decided that, that in the interest of uh, the environment and the public, we're, they went ahead and replaced that. So that was my very first uh, experience with Alyeska on, on this program. Yeah, so what, and it's hard. I mean, we had, we had a valve this year, um, check valve 92, that we couldn't get a good test on it. It took us a while. Well, what we found out was because of the train features, just if you just shut down and you don't actually induce the flow path, there wasn't any differential. So there was just enough in that, that seat. It just hung up. So it wasn't until we actually opened up some additional valves down uh, upstream of that valve back to pump nine and simulated a leak, you know, through that valve, which went back into the tankage, tank 190, and then it fully seated and fully closed. And then they can do measure, um, you know, what the pressures are on each side, does it stabilize, and whether there's any leak through. This one, most people probably don't know about our, our berms. Uh, this was done late 90s through the early 2000s. Um, Right as I came on board, this, these projects were finishing up. Um, you know, there was no regulatory driver. This was this was um, an Alieska initiative um, to look at our high consequence areas. What can we do to provide additional protection, additional measure? Um, so what we have is we have some significant containment berms out there for um, certain crossings. Um, this one, the photo is the Golcana River. And it's a trade-off. Um, you know, on one hand, it'd be nice, from my perspective, if that berm would have been right up at the river edge. It's also a wild and scenic river, so that's kind of a permitting trade-off there where BLM definitely 
likes the idea, but at the same time is trying to manage that as a wild and scenic and having a berm right there for the rafters coming through probably wasn't the wild and scenic they had envisioned. Uh, but again, what this does, and it's probably easier to see in the uh, uphand picture, you know, the whole a significant area, if there's a leak, would drain into that containment area. These aren't lined, so it's not permanent. You know, there's still impact, would be impacted material, but again, it would prevent the spread and migration of that. Um, we have these dikes built on the Tanana River on both sides, Golcana River both sides, Taslina on both sides, Clutina, it's only on the above ground side, the, the southern, southern portion of that around check valve uh, 109. So, okay, so now we're moving into preparedness. Um, so I'll go into more detail here about our, our training, our drills, um, our contingency plan, which we're all familiar with here, and our field operations guide. So first on our training program, um, to become a responder at Alieska on the pipeline, um, initially, before you're able to be on a response team, you have to go through a five-day initial training. So that's three days of classroom, which focuses primarily on, you know, has whopper, safety, benzene, hearing protection. And then it gets a little bit into ICS, how to organize, um, starts to get into uh, the theory of response actions, control actions. Then we have a day and a half of uh, hands-on training where we pull different suites, pumps, skimmers, equipment. Everyone goes through a performance check, has to demonstrate to the instructor that they're actually capable of starting up that equipment, setting it up, running it, and then ultimately the last day of any of our, our PTAs, our, our Pipeline Training Academy initial, is a full day of deployment. Um, we do them both in the winter and summer. It depends just when we're having new people kind of come in. We typically do, we've been running about three initial classes a year. Um, one, you know, one in February, one right in the middle of the summer, and then typically one coming up here in November. Uh, LAS employees and then our regulators come to them. Um, we invite them to come. Um, you know, we've had, I don't know how familiar you are with the, the state and their, their challenges right now. They're, they're having a huge turnover, uh, uh, kind of the same thing. We're seeing a lot of new people who are coming in to be regulatory specialists in, in spill response, and, and they really have limited spill response background, so we've made slots available uh, we think it's in everyone's best interest to to have the basic understanding. Um, if you just come and observe a drill, it looks easy. It's a lot of hard work that these people do. Um, annual refresher training. So what we do is, um, again, so once you've done your five day to remain current, you have to do a, a three day refresher, or I'm sorry, it's two days in the winter or three days in the, the summer. So the way we have that set up, um, so each of our facilities, they have an A shift, B shift. So this year, if A shift at pump five did a winter PTA, next year they'll be scheduled for a summer. So we're trying to do that, trying to recognize that, you know, the tactics, ICS is the same, your hazards are the same, but your, your tactics on the ground are very different from a winter and summer perspective. Um, in the winter uh, PTAs, we go through uh, ice trenching, um, how to, you know, we actually go out and deploy with our sleds, how to, you know, find oil under ice. I mean, it's a real challenge as, as Scott's trying to figure out, help sure, us. I have been thinking about in-river applications, but yeah, I should have been thinking yep. because it's the same, the ice is a little different, but the, the, the same technology. The, one of the interesting things about inland river um, oil under ice, um, you know, a couple things. One. That, that oil interfaces with the ice. It really slows it down significantly. It does not travel at the same speed of the water below it. The other challenge, so that's a benefit. It's gonna be much closer than, than maybe people would think to uh, spill. The challenge is that ice is not uniform. There are pockets, there are crevices. If you've been on a breakup area and you've seen that. Um, so we do work with Alaska Clean Seas. We're a member of Alaska Clean Seas, support uh, the joint industry preparedness program um, on some of the research activities. They're, they're making some progress on um, uh, uh, 
geophysical analysis and nuclear uh, uh, magnetic imagery of that. Right now, probably the lowest tech, simplest way is, is digging um, or drilling holes, putting a flashlight underneath and seeing that you either it's clear and you see light or you don't. It's, it's pretty low tech, but that's, that's a very proven technology. Um, I guess those are the required regulatory trainings. We do a lot of extra training um, that I, I think most people aren't aware of. Uh, this year, one of the things I'm proudest about, we did what we call a fast water response school. It's five days. Um, we did it in the middle of the summer on the Salcha River. We had about 45 to 50 participants. Um, it's really a five-day drill. I mean, that's the way. The first day, um, the lead instructors took their teams out. They deployed four or five different tactics, kind of taught everyone, you know, here's how you do a trolley system, here's how you do a cascade, here's how the boom vane works, here's how the harbor buster. The next four days, they came to the staging area every morning, didn't know who they were going to work with, were given an assignment, given a GPS location, given a suite of equipment. It may not have been what they wanted, <laughs> but this is what you got to do to go work with. And just real positive, great experience. Um, that's the third time that we've done it since I've been on the line. I'd like to be able to do it more frequently. Um, or is that the fourth time? It's the fourth time we've done it. Um, but yeah, it's about every two years. It's a significant um, time and resource commitment. So. Well, I think, you know, when you talk about locals in the area doing the ideas and, you know, mm -hmm. Right, and I'll and I'll talk a little bit more, and I'll describe how it happens. The Cascade resource. Hopefully, it makes more sense. Um, the other. And I will talk about our village response teams and some of the initiatives we have with locals ongoing. That. You know, the challenge here is we do a lot of things um, extra. It's not represented in the C plan. You know, there's things outside that our company does that's, that's not written in the C plan. Um, the other additional training we do, OMSET. Uh, I don't know if either of you are familiar with it. I know you are, Scott. Um, so it's uh, in New Jersey. It's a saltwater tank. Uh, you can actually put fresh oil on in it and run your skimmers, test skimmers. Uh, any of our response coordinators, pipeline civil maintenance coordinators, any of our leadership roles, if they come new to the company they haven't done that, they will, will do it, whether it's the first year or at least in the second year. Um, we've started <coughs> the last two years uh, working with Krell in New Hampshire, same kind of thing. They have the ability in their tank to actually build ice and put oil under ice. So not only do we get the training of how to slot ice and bring it to us, but again, see the effectiveness of these different skimmers um, during the winter kind of uh, uh, opportunities. Drills and exercises. Um, yeah, we do, we do a ton of drills and exercises. Um, so we, we adopted the uh, NPREP, National Preparedness for Response Exercise Program. It was developed by the U.S. Coast Guard. Um, we've adopted it to a higher level than what the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, one interpretation would be Alieska would need um, one of these drills or, or essentially these four or five drills a year and that would be it. We would consider it one pipeline and all drills are the same. What we did is we took those components and those components are right away recons, um, so right away is our, our right away for the pipeline, um, right away equipment deployments, our on scene command, which is uh, could be a tabletop or could be combined with one of the other exercises, and then a facility deployment, so a tank scenario. And we said, no, we're not going to apply it just you know those those types for the whole line. We're going to apply it at each facility. Well, in fact, we're going to apply it for each facility, each shift. So each shift at every facility, at a minimum, is going to have four exercises. Um, additionally, we have four qualified uh, individual exercises. It's 
primarily a call out, just uh, making sure people are available and ready to respond after hours. Um, we also do um, one pipeline incident management team um, exercise in addition. So ultimately what we do on the pipeline, we do 61 exercises through the year. Now we may combine several of those, for example, three of them during the year are, are large, large scale. We do one in the north, one in the central, one in the southern region. So large scale exercises from, oh, you know, probably the minimum is 50 people responding and participating up to 150, depending on, on the location and, and who's available. Um, this, what I highlighted here were some of our more recent ones that we've done in the, just the southern area. Um, we just finished October 1st, uh, Golcana River exercise. Uh, I think we had about 75 players, so, you know, serves participated, both shifts of Atna um, participated, Delta Response Base participated, our mobile command post GO team, as well as um, you know a lot of regulators coming in to participate as evaluators for that exercise. Um, Minton Creek, Salter River is one we have to exercise every five years. It's, it's our response planning standard scenario, so that's a mandate from the state. Um, we have a lot of flexibility in which locations we choose. One of the things we do, do I talk about it here or later? I'm going to talk about it now. Um, we have a five-year um, plan, program, that goes out to public comment. It, go, it, it goes part of the C plan. To my knowledge, no other company actually does that. Um, they might list at a very high level in their plan what their drill and exercise program, but um, you know, we provide all the major scenarios in there. Um, what we don't do in that public, or, or when we do the five-year plan, we will say this facility, Pump Station 5, their local exercises, we'll give rough dates for them, but we don't pinpoint the dates, and that, those scenarios are a little more uh, negotiated just the year before those exercises. So the next piece, I guess last piece on, on our preparedness is just our whole contingency plan. I was going to bring the plan for visual, but you've seen it, so... I, I didn't want to check in an extra bag. Um, yes, yes, um, you know, which is a challenge. Um, when I first came in, I think we had seven volumes. They were, it was regionally done, so Pump Station 1 through 4 had their region, 5 through Yukon, and um, it was not, a, in my opinion, it was not a very useful document. There, there are two very different um, Oh, two very different audiences for the C plan. So we have the regulatory piece and the public piece, and then we have the tool that we want our responders to actually use. Um, and in my experience, our older plan that had been generated right after uh, Open 90, 1992, um, just, just wasn't very useful as a, as a tool for the responders in the field. So what we did is um, we broke it into four volumes. Volume one is, is really our commitments in the plan. Here's our minimum staffing. Here's our minimum pieces of equipment. Here's the description of our entire system. Here's our leak detection, our pollution prevention pieces. Volume two are scenarios. So I think we're up to 15 scenarios now in the C plan. Um, different, you know, so we have DRA scenario. We have crude scenario probably have a diesel scenario in there. We have um, different locations, different regions, uh, both summer and winter, and we've mapped out, in theory, you know, one hypothetical way to pull all the resources necessary. Not saying that, you know, that's exactly how it would happen, but, you know, we've looked at those different scenarios, and it's more of a demonstration to show that we um, have the response capabilities to handle those types of uh, those events. Probably th the next two are the ones that get used the most by the field. The volume three is our tactics manual. Um, in it, it's got all of our response actions. So if, if you were a responder in a location and there is a spill, you can quickly go to that front part of the book. Um, it's, it's divided by summer sp or spring, summer, fall, and winter. And it will give you the primary um, you know, actions to take. You know, um, close these culverts, um, boom at this location, 
Um, here are your priority environmental areas. Um, you know, you have spring nesting in this location. Um, so it's, it's one page for each of the different mileposts where you can quickly get that information and at a very high level kind of begin your response. Um, also, we have containment sites, all of our maps there for our 223 containment sites. And if that scenario or that event actually has a containment site that would be appropriate to respond to, um, those sheets, and we've seen them at drills and exercises, they're torn out, handed to the task force leader, and that's their work order package here. You know, this is what we want you to do, go do this. Um, the field operations guide, oh, I'm sorry, volume four, it's a map atlas, so it's just information on, on you know, your, your material sites, where your valves are, your features. Um, pretty useful, that's all available internally in Alieska on our ANET, so people can, can pull that up, and they don't actually have to cart the large volumes around. Um, this is the one we see used all the time, the field operations guide. Um, I wish it was our idea, but I, I don't know who came first, but Alaska Clean Seas has one, Coast Guard has one, EPA has one. It's amazing, some of the graphics, they're all the same. I don't, you know, somebody should have got royalties for it. They would have done very, very well. Um, but it's used all the time. You can, mine's kind of weather beaten and, and used. Uh, it has our incident command system in it. Um, it has checklists if you're in the incident management team. Um, then it has tactical information in it. Uh, it has performance checks if you have any concerns or issues about, I forgot, you know, do I need to um, prime this pump or not? That information is in here, little cheat sheets like that. And uh, 2012 was the last time we updated it. It gets updated. It's, it will be due in 2014. Not significant changes, but uh, we will be capturing, collecting information, and updating it. So response at a high level, start talking about strategies, personnel, and equipment. Let's see where am I? So this is, these are the things that we like to train our folks on. Um, our number one objective is going to control the source. How do we do that? You know, that's, that's our best thing. If we can stop the source of the leak the fastest, that, that's the best thing we can do. First, OCC. One of the things OCC has done is they have gone line by line or mile by mile and mapped out. If we have a leak at this location, what are those operations? How do we shut down the line to minimize that volume? It's not always, it's not always uh, just shut everything in. There may be times where you shut up, shut the upstream valves down first, but we're going to run, you know, for example, pump station nine. We're going to de-inventory as much as we can, pull off as much pressure as we can. There are other times, pump one through four, a great example, basically it's, it's heading up, uh, uh, up the mountain. It's pump one to pump three are all check valves. If we had a spill north of pump three, we can go out, open those check valves, raise them, and essentially de-inventory the pipe and drain it all back into pump station one. So those procedures have been thought of um, and are available immediately if we have an incident. Next is our source control team, and I've, I've got a slide on them, so I'll, I'll go into more detail. But So we have a specialized team that is trained to come in and um, use different technologies to try to control the source, and then ultimately they will transition into the repair team. Next, um, containing the spill. What are our priorities? Our priority is, number one, if it's spill to land, keep it on land. It's a heavy equipment response. It's a civil response. Uh, we have a, we'll get into the equipment, but we have at all of our facilities lots of uh, yellow iron that's available to us. Um, that's our number one goal. If it's a spill that was on land that's starting to get into water, we also want to have, you know, still go in and dig those ditches, those berms, those trenches to prevent any more from entering water, uh, to minimize the amount of water. Uh, the leading edge, so this is where, um, it takes some assessment, you know, how far, based on the notification, where is the leading edge, where is my nearest containment site, looking at my response time, do I have the right people and equipment to get there. So the first task force, if, if we were doing a spill right now, task force one's going to get deployed to go as close to the spill site as possible and either set up containment and prevent any additional migration into the water. Our second task force is going to try to find that sweet spot and challenge that leading edge. Um, 
You don't want to be too conservative and say, well, it's two miles from the pipeline and we're going to, we're going to go 40 miles down. No, you, that second team is going to go. It is a judgment call. It's a, it's a, it's a, you want to push that envelope. The third team, so team two, let's say in that hip hypothetical scenario, is going to try to deploy about 10 miles downstream. That's enough time to get their boom set in before the leading edge hits them. That third team is only going to be a couple miles below them, but we are assured that that team has enough time to get their full deployment in. Um, those are so. Those are the. That's what we train. We train and we push and we teach. Attack this spill. Um, that's our our best strategy on a river. So the source control team. Here's our specialized team. Uh, they're actually preparing to remove insulation. This is at Nordale Yard. We have a test piece of pipe at that location where they train. They get annual training. We do an annual drill with this team. There's about 40 individuals. Um, most of the, the individuals are out of our fabrication facility, so they're specialty craft, pipe fitters, welders. Um, they're pretty amazing what they can do. Um, take a lot of pride in this. Their tactics and equipment, we have a hyd hydraulic clamp, so it's an, uh, an articulated arm. Um, it's sized for about four inch type of hole or less. It's primarily ideally suited for if we had another bullet hole. Um, it could also be used if there was a shape charge type event. Um, shape charge, well we've had two sabotage events on, on Alyeska's history. One was a charge, a C4 plastic explosive back in the... Yeah, so... Um, we also have, uh, uh, but the clamp takes time to get there. You know, it's a great, it's a great tool because if the hole size is appropriate, we can actually seal it, and it can be considered a temporary repair. We also have deflection sleeves. They're very simple, very low tech. They're built to the right radius for um, whether the insulation's on, or we also have some for if the insulation's off. That is not a pressure sealing device. It simply goes over. Uh, again, milepost 400 scenario. It can be quickly attached to the pipe. Um, and then you can attach hosing so you can direct and capture the leak of oil. Um, our team clamp, that's what we use to uh, do the repair at milepost 400. It's, it's still in our inventory. Um, it takes a crane. It's, very, it's a large, bulky piece of equipment. It's not our, our primary response tool. Uh, we have plugs and sleeves. Um, the shape charge event I mentioned in the 70s, they, they sleeved right over it and welded it um, while it was still leaking. Um, bullet clamps, so we've modified our bullet hole clamps. The, the, again, e e not, not a single one of these is the magic answer. There's a repertoire, there's a suite of things that work for us. Um, the bullet hole clamp you probably need to get the pressure down in the line before that's successful and you can actually apply it. Um, maybe 150, 200 PSI. Um, you know, so if, but what's nice about the bullet hole clamp, the way we've built them, once it's a TOR uh, threaded O-ring fitting, so once it's in place and, and you've sealed it, then you can actually weld it and can be a permanent repair like, like that. So it, again, each one of these have different um, applications. Water displacement. This is uh, one we exercised on the Clutina River back in 2009. So the concept is, maybe Gabe, back to your your question, you get that small leak. You know, especially if it's a buried river crossing. What do you do? You know, to excavate, to repair, to replace is a long time. So just stealing from the industry is is we have pumps, we have the hosing, um, we have the process and procedures. We would simply go to the upstream valve inject in the bypass and inject water and displace the oil. There'd still be a leak, but it would be leak, um, you know, oily water versus pure crude oil. Mm -hmm.